Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we want to welcome you to this year's Pediatric Oncology Breakout Session. It certainly goes without saying that this year is unlike any that we've experienced in the past. We appreciate your tremendous commitment to Dana-Farber, and we want to thank you for attending the meeting today. My name is Conrad Wetterow, and I am a proud member of the Dana-Farber Board of Directors, and I am pleased to serve as co-chair for this year's breakout alongside Allison Purbu Jaffe, also a member of the board. For those of you who are joining the symposium for the first time, we typically host this event in person and we enjoy a wonderful dialogue and exchange together. So in this situation, Alice and I are gonna do our very best today to keep this session as interactive as we possibly can. We have a terrific session planned today and we have asked the presenters to leave plenty of time for question and answers after each of their presentations. In addition, we will wrap up the presentations at about 2.30 this afternoon and spend the last 10 to 15 minutes discussing our thoughts and takeaways from the day to bring to the executive session where Alice and I will share our feedback uh, with Dana-Farber's president and CEO, Dr. Lori Glimpshire. Certainly, we'd encourage all of you to share any comments you have with us through the chat function uh, or during the open question and answer uh, period as we go through the day. Allison, we'll talk to you a little bit later this, this, uh, during this opening here uh, in a little bit more detail. To begin, as I hand things over to Allison, I'd like to ask each of you who are listening today to use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen to type in your name, your town or city, and state that you're currently in. And whether this is your first time attending this pediatric oncology breakout session, so that we can all have a better idea of who is in the audience. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Allison. Thank you, Conrad, and to all of you for joining us today. I'd also like to echo Conrad's thanks for your support and all your commitment to Dana-Farber. We are thrilled to welcome back Dr. Scott Armstrong and Dr. Lisa Diller, our faculty co-chairs of this breakout session. In a moment, you'll hear Dr. Armstrong speak about the remarkable work happening across Dana-Farber and pediatrics. We will then introduce two members of the faculty, Drs. Lewis Silverman and Leslie Keene, who will speak about some exciting advancements in the treatment of childhood leukemia. Then Dr. Diller will be moderating a special panel of pediatric survivorship experts, including Dr. Linda Vrooman, Dr. Christopher Reclitus, and Dr. Tabitha Cooney. While the agenda is full, Conrad and I want to encourage as much Q&A as possible. As an aside, if you knew how low tech I am, you would understand how ironic it is that I am the one to explain the technology for asking questions today. But don't worry, I've been well prepped. There are actually two ways to ask questions. One option is to use the chat box in your lower right. Conrad and I want to, um, where you'll see a small icon with a question mark. If you click on that icon and type your question, Conrad and I will help relay your question to the speakers. We'll do our best to get to every question. We would love to encourage as many live on-camera questions using the second option. If you look at your name in the participant box, on the right side of your screen, next to your name, you'll see the icon to raise your hand. 
So when it's time to take questions, you can raise your hand and our technical team will bring you on camera and activate your audio to allow you to ask your question. To do this seamlessly, we would like to suggest that you all make sure your video and audio active is active right now by activating the video and audio on your, um, on your screen. You will not actually be on camera and will remain muted unless you raise your hand and are called on. So to recap, you can ask questions live on camera with your video and audio on active. You won't be on camera and remain muted unless you raise your hand and are called on. If you prefer the other option, just simply click on the question mark in your chat box and write um, your question in the box and Conrad and I will post a question to our presenters. With that, I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Scott Armstrong. He has been the chair of Dana-Farber's Department of Pediatric Oncology since 2016. He is a pediatric oncologist and a world expert in the treatment of childhood leukemia. He also leads a center at Dana-Farber focused on the development of new treatments for pediatric cancer. Scott, thank you for your leadership and for joining us today. Thank you, Allison and Conrad, um, for the introduction. And also, thank you for hosting um, this symposium as you do every year, uh, and we are very thankful for that continued support, uh, this year being much more complicated than usual given the technical complexities that we're uh, getting to deal with uh, during this, this particular uh, presentation. I also wanna thank all of you that have joined. Um, we very much appreciate your continued support. Um, and of course, we would much rather be doing this in person, I personally, find the interactions that we usually have during uh, this session, uh, during the in-person presidential symposium, very motivating and inspiring. So I very much look forward to doing that in person again next year for all the reasons that you might imagine, including the fact that it would mean that this pandemic is largely behind us. Um, so the, the goal of the day is similar to what it usually is, is that is to update you on some of the things going on in the department um, and have you meet a few uh, of the faculty uh, who are doing that work. And I thought I would start with a little bit of an introduction overview of some of the things that have happened with a little bit more focus on the lab-based research because our other talks are going to be much more clinical and translational. Um, and also we thought it would be um, of interest to just briefly uh, remind you of the history of this program. And for those that haven't uh, been quite as involved with Dana-Farber, this might be new. For those of you who have been, uh, you may or may not know all, all these details. So the Dana-Farber as it currently exists, as most of you know, um, really grew from the initial treatment of a child with leukemia with chemotherapy by Dr. Sidney Farber uh, in the 1940s. Uh, that led to a foundation that ultimately would grow to become the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He at the time was at Children's Hospital and uh, somewhat in parallel, the division of hematology at Children's Hospital was growing, was founded by Lewis Diamond, who's considered really the father of pediatric hematology. And then in 1967, Dr. David Nathan, who many of you know because he was also the president of Dana-Farber, took over as the chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology at Children's. And then in 1974, when Dr. Farber passed away, the Dana-Farber or the Sidney Farber Cancer Institute at the time, um, the, uh, the program really formally merged, that is, uh, became what we know today as the joint Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorders Center. So this has really been a collaboration between the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Department of Pediatric Oncology, of which I'm the chair, and the Division of Hematology Oncology, of which David Williams is the chief. This has been a collaboration since 1974. 
and really the ability to bring together one of the world's best cancer institutes and one of the world's best pediatric hospitals has what's, is what's driven our being ranked by US News and World Report um, in the top two or three for the past 10 years and having been ranked number one more than any other program in the country. So um, really continues to be a close uh, collaboration. A little bit of detail, again, that some of you may not know, uh, the Dana-Farber Boston Children's Joint Faculty, so the, the Joint Programs Faculty, um, range on the order of 120 faculty, so it's a very large program. There is a formal relationship between the two um, and a set of board members from Dana-Farber and Boston Children's that get together um, every quarter or so. A.J. Janauer, who is a trustee at Dana-Farber, is currently chairing that group. I'm currently the president of the joint program. This rotates every few years, and Lisa Diller, the chief medical officer. As I mentioned, there are some over 100 faculty, ranging between 120 to 130, that range all the way from um, really first year faculty, often instructors, all the way to uh, full professors at Harvard Medical School. Most of the pediatric cancer faculty are um, at the Dana-Farber physically, not all, these are not absolutes, um, and most hematology and stem cell biology faculty are at Boston Children's. But honestly, most of the faculty really don't recognize that separation. It really is a, is a joint program. And clinically, the inpatient oncology and inpatient hematology uh, is at Children's on the sixth floor of Boston Children's Hospital and outpatient, the outpatient hematology clinic at Children's. And then most of you know, the outpatient oncology clinic uh, or the Jimmy Fund Clinic is at Dana-Farber. We have a very large lab-based research component, one of the largest in the country, um, by most accounts, one of the, the, the most successful in the country with almost 90,000 square feet of lab-based research at Children's and at Dana-Farber. So a very big operation for a pediatric hematology oncology program. In the past uh, eight months or so, we have hired a number of new faculty. We continue to grow and continue to push many of our initiatives forward. Um, you may know some of these individuals. Angela Farrako is has taken over as uh, the lead of our Hodgkin's disease clinical program, and she does quality of life research. Um, we also have hired Melissa Burns, who focuses clinically or clinical research on uh, drug development in, for leukemia and, and treats patients with hematologic malignancies. Uh, Maya Illawite has taken on an important role as the leader in our clinical informatics um, program. As you probably know, that the um, informatics part of medicine continues to become increasingly complicated, and it's very important that we have somebody leading that. And then in a moment, I'll talk more about Volker Hovestad. Um, he is a world-renowned, recently appointed basic computational biologist uh, who's going to work with a number of our faculty uh, on the biology of childhood cancer. I won't go into detail about any particular priorities right now. Um, you've heard a lot of this if you've attended in the past, um, but if four of them are, are shown here. And they remain largely unchanged from what you saw last year with a little bit of an expansion. So one area that we think there's a lot of potential for both discovery and growth and clinical impact is in genetic predisposition uh, and prevention. And, and actually, this will dovetail a little bit into the discussion you hear uh, later about survivorship. We now know that more than 10% of childhood cancers um, arise as a result of some degree of genetic predisposition. What the real percentage is is not clear. Um, still a lot of work to be done here, but needless to say, the better we understand who's at risk and what they're at risk for, the better we can think about um, potentially even ways to prevent progression of disease. A concept that I would say historically we've not thought much about in pediatric cancer um, because it really wasn't, um, we didn't think there was the likelihood that a prevention strategy might exist 
but once one knows that there are some genetic predispositions or potentially genetic predispositions, you can start to think about that. Another area is immunotherapy. You've heard us talk about this uh, quite a bit in the past couple of years. You'll hear more about it from Leslie Keene today, a very new and exciting uh, mode of therapy, not just in pediatric cancers, but in adult cancers as well. The approaches in pediatric cancer are slightly different, it appears, than those in adult cancers. So we've got um, plans for development in that area. Drug, small molecule drug discovery and development, you've heard discussed here many times over the years, that continues to push forward. And then a, a new area, mostly because of the fact that Kira Bona, a very talented, um, relatively new faculty, some of you have actually met her, we had her speak here a couple of years ago, is really leading the country in how to think about social determinants of health and health disparities in pediatric cancer and um, really doing amazing work there, and we're excited to help her uh, grow that program as well. Just a couple of um, comments about some of the work that be being done in the labs. Again, we'll probably talk, have uh, maybe have Seagal talk next year, but uh, one of the lab-based faculty in the department, Seagal Kadosh, um, has really over the past year done an amazing job of understanding one of the fundamental protein complexes that we know is critical in many types of cancer, including childhood cancer. And in fact, probably the, there are mutations in up to 30% of all human cancers in this co protein complex called the BAF, BAF complex. Um, that complex is, a, is a, about 10 to 15 different proteins that come together to really change the structure of DNA to turn genes on and off. That's a process that we've, you've heard about in the past called epigenetics. And we know it's central to the development of many pediatric cancers. This picture here in the middle, there's the machine on the left gives the picture on the right. And, and I show this just because this is really something that's never been able to be done before. That picture on the right is the actual physical structure of a complex of some nine different proteins wrapped around the blue in the middle there is actually DNA. So you can see this is essentially a large machine that puts DNA in a vise and opens it up so that the genes can be read. And as I mentioned, this machine on the left called a cryo electron micrograph machine allowed her to, to develop this structure, which has really never been seen before. So really exciting work. This was just published two weeks ago um, in the journal Cell, which is the highest um, basic science journal you can publish in. Uh, and that complex is uh, involved in the process called epigenetics. My group, having been interested in infant leukemia for quite some time, which is also driven by an epigenetic complex, and we've re recently developed a number of small molecules, one of which is shown here, the yellow um, uh, spaghetti in the middle of the red and blue picture there, that is actually in clinical trials uh, and some of the first few patients, adults with this subtype of leukemia, but it's also found more frequently in kids. Um, there have been some uh, pretty impressive clinical responses. And the fundamental concept here is very similar to what Seagal was working on, is that is if we can disrupt and understand these proteins and how they turn genes on and off, therape therapeutically we should be able to intervene. And there's a, another emerging concept, more in adult cancers, but this could play out in, in kids as well, that if we are following patients closely enough, and this gets back to the genetic predisposition, we actually may be able to intervene therapeutically prior to the patient developing full-blown um, aggressive cancer. This is a process called cancer interception um, that is really generating a lot of excitement. Um, and we're starting to understand ways that we might go do something about that. Uh, to prevent leukemia development. I mentioned the computational biologist that we recruited, Volker Hovestad. So m many of you probably know from attending these in the past that we are now very good at generating all kinds of different data on cancer samples, clinical samples, models. Analyzing that data is now often the rate limiting step. So we recruited Volker to the department He's a world-renowned computational biologist um, who trained with um, one of the leaders in this field, Brad Bernstein, at the Broad Institute. And he is interested in single-cell technology when it's working in, in, um, most recently with Mariella Philbin 
and Mimi Bandopetai on uh, brain tumors. And the concept here is, is that we know that, for example, a brain tumor, when uh, when resected, is made up of many different cell types. It's not just one cell type. It's not a cancer. It's not just a growth of one cell type. But we've never really been able to disentangle that. And now with this technology, Mariella, Mimi, many people now can separate these single cells and actually look at which of the 20,000 genes are turned on in an individual cell. It gives you then something that looks like the output here on the right. And those are those individual spots or individual cells, and they're colored based on the genes that are turned on. And you can see that there are some eight or nine different cell types in the tumor that was analyzed there. The importance of this is now we can start to see, try to see how this influences therapeutic responses. And that's what Mariella and Mimi are doing. And this is incredibly technically sophisticated and having someone like Volker to help them is really going to help push all of our work ahead. Um, but initially Mariella and Mimi's. And then I just want to finish uh, my part of the talk with, with bringing this up for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, it's a picture of me with a mask on. And in fact, I thought I'd probably look better in this picture than any I've ever seen. Um, but also to let you know that all of that money you're spending with Amazon, I certainly know I am, um, is coming back to some good. They gave us a $500,000 check a few weeks ago and we've um, split that money between Lisa Sherber and you know her incredible work in the clinic, some of the drug discovery efforts, and also has given us the ability to support Kira's work uh, in social determinants of health to a greater extent. So uh, we were very happy to get the phone call from Amazon uh, wanting to, to support us. So I'm gonna stop there. I think we may have a few minutes for some questions. Um, this is this afternoon's panel. You've already heard that uh, Lewis and, and Leslie are going to talk. I'll introduce them in a moment. And then we're going to have a, a discussion about pediatric cancer survivorship that's going to be led by Lisa Diller. So um, I think I will stop there and we can see what questions there are. All right. Does anybody any have questions? any questions? Yep. So I. Scott? Yes. Now, um, we've heard a lot about immunotherapy in adult cancers and not as much as in pediatric cancers. Is that something that you see is going to be developed or pursued in the future? Yes. Yeah, so the, the reason that we hear a, a little more about immunotherapy in adult cancers is because the type of immunotherapy that has uh, been discussed the most and for which the Nobel Prize was given a couple of years ago um, is a type called checkpoint inhibition, which means basically you treat a patient with, in this case, an antibody that makes it such that the, that the patient's immune system can now recognize the tumor and you get a really impressive response, most initially in, in diseases like melanoma. That type of approach has not yet been shown to work broadly in pediatric cancers. The type of approach that has been shown to work in pediatric cancers and mostly in leukemia is where you actually take the immune cells from the patient, take them out uh, of the patient's blood and engineer them in a way that they can be re-injected. These are so-called CAR T cells. And those actually do show impressive responses in pediatric leukemias. I'm sure Leslie will talk, Keen will talk about this in a minute as well. So there is for sure going to be continued development of CAR T cells to other types of leukemia and maybe even solid tumors. But we're hoping as we understand how a child's immune system recognizes cancer cells, we should be able, hopefully able to do something simpler, similar in pediatric cancer to what's been done in adult cancers. And we have, um, work going on in the department by Birgit Nokel asking exactly that question. So it's just a little bit, again, much like we've seen in many other settings, pediatric cancer is slightly different. The, the concepts are the same, but the, the, the how things work are slightly different than in adult cancers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Scott. Another question is, um, can you talk about the importance of the collaboration between 
um, the pediatrics and their colleagues on the adult side, just to build on what you were saying about the immunotherapy? Yeah, so the I mean, that's one of the major benefits of, of being in a, an institution or institutions where you really have collaboration um, across the age range because twofold. One, many of the drugs that ultimately will be used in pediatrics will often be developed first in adults for maybe obvious reasons. And so really having close relationships with the people developing those in adult cancers allows us to more quickly move them in into pediatrics. And secondly, the, the fundamentals, as I mentioned, are the same. That is, the processes as to how the cancers develop are the same. If there's often different genes that are doing it. So when you're able to interact with people on in cancer biology or medical oncology, and luckily we have world leaders in all these areas, um, it really moves things forward. In the epigenetic space, for example, Miles Brown, who's studying hormone responsive breast cancers, is one of the leaders in the world in that, and the National Academy of Sciences for that work. Um, we go back and forth in discussing how epigenetics works in kids versus adults. And it's more about the fundamental mechanisms. And that really is useful to be able to have those discussions. I remember in the past hearing about um, advances and discoveries happening in pediatrics that have helped adults. Does the relationship go in both directions? For sure. I, I mean, so, you know, Fundamental examples of that are the fact that chemotherapy was first developed, which is most people don't realize this, that chemotherapy was developed as a way to treat pediatric cancer, not actually as a way to treat adult cancers, and then ultimately adults were treated with it as well. Um, and then, again, the kind of the more fundamental aspects of, of um, what we're learning, the, the fact that leukemias are have specific genetic abnormalities that drive their development was really driven first in pediatrics and now um, is, uh, is commonplace to, to think about in adults as well. So it, it really is a back and forth. All right, Allison, should we, uh, do we need to move on now? Uh, I guess, Scott, you will be introducing the next, the next right. speaker. Sure. So the next uh, session is focused on new approaches to treat high-risk leukemia. As many of you know, leukemia is uh, very common in, in, in children. It's one of our most common types of cancer. And there's been incredible progress made in the treatment of um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and particularly subtypes that respond really, really well to chemo. But there are still subtypes of pediatric leukemia that are difficult to treat. And that's where many of us are focused, trying to understand uh, what we can do about that. And so we're going to have two of our leaders in this area talk today. First is Lewis Silverman. Many of you know Lewis, or probably have you probably seen him talk at one of these before in person. Lewis was the head of our hematologic malignancies program, <coughs> now the vice chair for clinical affairs across the department. Uh, so he'll talk uh, first, and then we followed by Leslie Keene, who many of you may not have met. Leslie is uh, was recruited here a couple of years ago to lead our bone marrow transplant program. She's a leader in the immunology of bone marrow transplantation and is also working in the fields of immunotherapy. And she'll talk about um, what some of the people in, in her, in the bone marrow transplant program are doing as well. So I think uh, maybe Lewis is up first. So we'll turn it over to you, Lewis. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. And thank you everybody um, it's really a pleasure to take part in this session. I only regret that uh, we're unable to do it in person, as everybody has said, but hopefully that will happen next year. And I um, do encourage uh, questions um, about what I'm talking about. Um, as, as Scott said, and as you've heard, uh, leukemia is, is, is the most common type of cancer we see in kids. And we've been really fortunate in pediatric oncology that our most common cancer is also very curable. There's been great progress over the last several decades, uh, particularly in the most common type of leukemia we see, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, and as shown on the curve on the left, 
um, the overall survival rate for children walking through the door in 2020 with the new diagnosis of childhood ALL is, approaches 90%. That means nine out of 10 kids um, that walk through our door are cured of their disease, which is great. Um, but really, it's not all good news, and we still have a lot of work to do in childhood leukemia. Because the flip side of saying nine out of 10 are cured of their disease means still one out of 10 aren't cured and die of their disease. And we have to do better for them. Um, and the salvage for those patients whose disease comes back, who relapses, remains suboptimal. Uh, and it's really that population that we have to focus our efforts on. How do we make things better? How do we cure those patients who our current therapies are failing? But even for those that we're curing, there, there's a lot of challenge in the work that we do because our current treatments are associated with many acute and long-term toxicities. And you're gonna be hearing later on in this session about survivorship, which really informs a lot of the research we're doing now in childhood leukemia to reduce the burden of our cure. And really the, the curve I showed you is for childhood ALL, our most common type of diagnosis, but there are many other types of leukemia that children can get, AML, the particular type of ALL that babies get, a very rare type called JMML. And these uh, subtypes of leukemia have not achieved the same success that we've seen in childhood ALL. So really there's a lot of room for improvement in this disease. And that's really the focus of the work that we do here at Dana-Farber and researchers across the country and world are doing. So really what, 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 what I'm driving at is I, I, I think Right now where we stand, there's a compelling need to identify more effective and less toxic therapies. And I'm gonna focus my talk on, on two main points. One is on our search here for developing and testing genomically targeted therapies, taking advantage of the explosion in uh, technology and our understanding of genomics and biology of leukemia that I can tell you five or 10 years ago, we did not have and now are able to do. And I'm gonna touch a little bit on immunotherapies that you've already heard uh, an introduction on and had some questions about. Uh, and the role of immunotherapies in particular in, in, in childhood ALL and the great advances we've seen uh, in the development of these immunotherapeutic approaches in that disease. So let's start with, with genetics. Um, we've known for quite a bit of time that this grab bag that we called ALL is really made up of several distinctive biologically uh, distinctive subtypes of the disease that can be characterized by chromosomal abnormalities of the leukemia subtype. Um, and that these different subtypes don't all behave in the same way and don't respond to chemotherapy in the same way. And one of the subtypes that was first discovered is a subtype called the Philadelphia chromosome positive uh, type of ALL. This is seen in about 5% of pediatric patients with ALL. It's actually more common in adults. And it's characterized by a very specific chromosomal abnormality involving one gene on chromosome nine, another gene on chromosome 22. Oh, the slides just went away. Um, I don't know if the slides, there we go. Okay, thank you, sorry about that. Um, so it's characterized by a chromosomal abnormality, um, a gene on chromosome nine called BCR ABL, another gene on chromosome 22 called uh, BCR, the other gene is called ABL. Uh, in this type of leukemia, those two genes translocate, they end up in the wrong place. The genes fuse and make a protein that's called a tyrosine kinase. This tyrosine kinase from the BCR able fusion is the driver of this particular type of leukemia. This leukemia is more common in, a, in our uh, adolescent and young adult population and has a very poor prognosis with standard chemotherapy agents. And really prior to 2000, the standard of care for these patients was to treat them with a stem cell transplant and first remission. And even with that, more than half of the patients did not survive the disease. There was a great breakthrough in, in about the year 2000 where there was a development of a, uh, a drug that specifically targeted the fusion protein that these two genes put together in this subtype of leukemia, the bcr able fusion. Um, these types of drugs were called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, the first of these was the drug imatinib. The second was the drug dasatinib. And up oh, the slides went away again. Um, I don't know why this keeps happening. There we go. Um, and uh, 
these drugs were shown to be quite active in the subtype of leukemia. And what's shown here is a clinical trial that demonstrated that if you add a tyrosine kinase inhibitor to chemotherapy, there was a marked improvement in survival in this group of patients um, and, and, and really uh, took away the need for bone marrow transplant in the major majority of these patients. And really that's become the prototype of what we're looking for in childhood leukemia. There's a whole field that's developed that's called precision medicine. Precision medicine is really looking for uh, specific genetic subtypes and looking for the genetic drivers for different types of cancer and developing therapies that will target those genetic drivers. A much more specific and elegant way to treat the leukemia than chemotherapy is, which is really a non-specific way of just stopping cells from dividing. So really in precision medicine, what you try to do is take the type of cancer, molecularly profile it, get the genomics, understand them. You can use those genomics to, to identify prognostic markers, find high-risk leukemias, but even more important to find targets for that type of leukemia, develop the targets, and then use them to treat the patients. Here at Dana-Farber, we've actually been leading the uh, childhood leukemia uh, precision uh, therapy effort for the entire nation. Uh, led by Jana Pickman, who's shown here, one of our uh, leukemia investigators, we've been running a, a multi-center protocol uh, for pediatric patients with relapse, refractory, or high-risk leukemias. And this map shows you that really all the leading centers, pediatric cancer centers in the country, participate in this protocol that we're leading. The primary aim of this protocol is to determine the feasibility of identifying and acting on actionable alterations for pediatric patients with leukemia. We include ALL and first or greater relapse and all other types of childhood leukemia, including AML and rare leukemia subtypes. The way this works is that uh, patients who have these subtypes of leukemia at any of the participating centers have samples sent to us here at Dana-Farber. We genomically characterize the sample. That takes about a week. Uh, after the results are back, an expert panel is convened, reviews the results of the samples, and makes a targeted therapy recommendation based on these biologic subtypes. This has been a remarkable effort, a remarkable collaborative effort, and really a remarkable success. So with this, we've been able to identify in these high-risk leukemias, 74% of the patients who have samples for us have a targeted therapy recommendation that we can make. And in following up, uh, we found that 15% of the patients actually received the therapy that we identified as active for their leukemia. We've been trying to move forward um, these genomic advances to our upfront patients, even within childhood ALL, which I told you is such a success. Here at Dana-Farber, we run our own trials for patients with newly diagnosed childhood ALL. Our Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Consortium was started by Steve Salin, whose picture is here, in 1973. I've been running this consortium since 2000. We enroll about 100 patients a year at different uh, eight different institutions in the U.S. and Canada with an overall objective of improving cure rates and decreasing toxicity. Um, our current trial is trying to incorporate advances in genomics into uh, the therapy of patients with newly diagnosed leukemia. We're piloting a new risk stratification in this group, which incorporates these genomics uh, to, to, to recognize, identify newly recognized biologic subsets, uh, add targeted therapy to them, and to risk stratify the therapy we give uh, in order to treat the highest risk patients differently. In this trial, we've recognized a particular gene deletion, uh, which characterizes a subset of children with uh, new leukemia, uh, a deletion of a gene called Icarus or IKZF1. It's in about 15% of children with leukemia. If, if you just treat these kids as you normally would treat them, they have a much higher risk of relapse, which is what the curve shows you on the left. But fortunate for us, a, a subset of these patients actually have other genetic aberrations that are targetable by that very same class of compounds I showed you was active uh, for patients with P Philadelphia chromosome positive ALL, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And on the 16001 protocol, we're testing adding tyrosine kinase inhibitors for those patients who don't have the Philadelphia chromosome, but have aberrations similar to the Philadelphia chromosome that we believe will be sensitive to the same class of drugs. 
Moving on really briefly to conclude my talk, I just wanted to talk a little bit about in, immunotherapeutic approaches. It's a really exciting advance in the field of treating high-risk leukemia. There's a number of different approaches uh, that are out there uh, that we can use that have really increased our, uh, our ability to successfully manage patients with relapse and refractory ALL. Uh, there's different types of antibodies that we can use. There's an antibody called inotuzumab, which targets a certain protein that's on ALL and that antibody is linked to a toxin so that what we're doing is really delivering chemotherapy in a very targeted way to the leukemia. It's quite active in relapse and refractory disease. It's used in both adult and pediatric patients uh, and really has a remarkable uh, success rate. There's another very interesting drug that we're using uh, and testing here in our trials called blinatumumab. This drug is really an antibody that has uh, two uh, targets. It takes, uh, it targets the T cells of the child's own body, uh, and it targets the B cell leukemia that resides in their body and simply brings the two together. So what it's really doing is bringing the T cells, the child's immune cells next to the leukemia cell. And just by physically approximating them, the T cell can kill the leukemia cell. It too has uh, really remarkable activity, and we're testing it in our upfront ALL trial now. And I wanted just to briefly tell people about uh, uh, chimeric antigen or CAR T cells. It's really an exciting and advance uh, that uh, many people have heard about in the news, and that we have developed the leadership of uh, as the major treating center for CAR T cells uh, within New England and one of the major treating centers for children with leukemia throughout the country. So really what a CAR T cell is, is again, trying to take advantage of the child's own immune system to help kill the leukemia cell. It's a completely different mechanism of, of treating leukemia than using chemotherapy. What we do is we uh, harvest the child's own immune cells. So the, the child is phoresed, blood is removed from the child. We take out their white blood cells, which are their immune cells, give back the rest of the blood. The immune cells are then separated so that the T cells are purified from the child. They're sent off to a lab where those T cells are genetically modified. So now the T cells will target something that is on the surface of the B lymphoblastic leukemia, a protein called CD19. When those cells are ready, they come back to us and we can infuse them into the child in the same way you get a blood transfusion. These now genetically modified T cells will seek out any ALL cells that are in the body um, and kill those ALL cells. Uh, these, this has really shown a, a remarkable activity. Uh, over 90% of children who have relapsed refractory disease, disease that has relapsed after all standard chemotherapy, can achieve a complete remission with an infusion of a CAR T cell. It's really uh, incredible, uh, the responses we have seen. Um, and we've seen some durable responses with it. So just with a CAR T cell infusion, it looks like up to 50% of these relapsed refractory children uh, maintain those remissions. But that also means that 50% do not. And there's a lot of work that we still need to do to understand how to use CAR T cells, who's really cured by this approach, whether we use this approach as a bridge to other approaches such as stem cell transplant, but really such promise moving forward. And Dana-Farber really is uh, helping to lead the field in the incorporation of CAR T cells in the treatment of childhood leukemia. So really uh, to summarize my talk, over the last decade, we've really had incredible advances in our, in our approaches to childhood leukemia and high-risk leukemia. There's been advances in genomic characterization of leukemias that's helped us to uh, identify novel uh, genetic prognostic factors to better stratify our therapy and the development of novel targeted therapies that really go after what is the genetic underpinning of this leukemia. This has led to precision medicine trials in high-risk leukemia that we've led here at Dana-Farber, looking at tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, as we're doing in our upfront trial and the pediatric LEAP trial that I showed you uh, running the gamut of all of our high-risk leukemias. In the immunotherapeutic approaches, a completely different way uh, to treat the leukemia, uh, really a, a game changer in sort of the, the uh, addition of effective therapies for these uh, diseases. So it's really a very exciting time uh, to be in this field. Uh, a lot of promise for the future, a lot of work to be done. Um, 
I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Can people hear me? Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Lewis, for that great talk. And I'm actually going to uh, sort of uh, really uh, move forward with this idea of immunotherapeutic approaches for children uh, with leukemia in my talk. And really, um, let's see, do I have control of the... Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and and really talk, talk about our uh, innovative uh, approaches in stem cell transplant. So just to give you a little bit of a introduction to myself, um, as Scott said, I was recruited here to the Dana-Farber about two and a half years ago to lead the program in stem cell transplantation. And I can tell you, it's just been such an amazing uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Boston Children's Hospital and the Jimmy Fund Clinic are the premier um, institution for research and clinical care for kids uh, with cancer and other hematologic uh, diseases. And what I was brought here to do is really move our program forward in terms of the clinical trials that we are doing in stem cell transplantation and cellular therapies. And I'm gonna tell you about some really exciting new initiatives that we have um, that we have started uh, very recently. So the title of my talk is Doing What's Right for Kids, Innovative Trials in Stem Cell Transplantation and Cellular Therapies. And I'll tell you, we, that's what we try to keep at our, the forefront of, of our minds. What do the kids that come to us need? How can we do right by them so that they can get a full life um, and a full healthy life? So our stem cell transplant program is the biggest or one of the top three in the country. We do over 140 uh, transplants and cellular therapies uh, per year. And I'm particularly proud of our outstanding faculty. We have 16 physicians who are on faculty um, in our stem cell transplant program, which is really uh, recognized in the country as not only having a depth of real clinical expertise, but also being at the forefront of research. And I think that is really coming to fruition uh, these days. And we need all these faculty in our program because the number of transplants that are being done in this country, both for adults and for children, continue to grow. So it is a regulatory requirement uh, uh, that all transplants get registered with a national registry called the CIBMTR. So we know exactly how many transplants are being done each year. And I think that this graphic really shows you how this treatment continues to grow. And the most uh, sort of the, the uh, most common indication that we transplant for here at the Dana-Farber in pediatrics is kids with leukemia both uh, the ALL, so the B-cell ALL, as well as T-cell ALL, and also a really difficult cancer to treat uh, AML. And I'm gonna highlight some of our, our cellular therapy um, initiatives in, uh, for, for these uh, patients. So it's very important that when we think about what we need to do to get every kid their cure, that we look at the major causes by which our primary, um, our primary procedure, bone marrow transplant, fails in kids. Because we know that depending on the child who comes to transplant, remember these are the children that have often relapsed after their, uh, after their upfront treatment for their leukemia, whether it be ALL or AML. And transplant is still the most successful treatment for these very, very high risk kids. But even though that is the case, uh, transplant still carries with it uh, only a 50% long-term success rate. This is, um, this is a real challenge for us. And what's, uh, what we lean on when we're trying to figure out how to confront the failures in transplant is again, data from this national registry, which tells us why we fail. And I wanna point out the two most common reasons that transplants fail for our kids because we've got trials 
that are addressing just these issues. So the first is primary disease relapse. When we transplant a child for, with either ALL or AML, the biggest thing we worry about is, is this child going to relapse after transplant? And then the second most common complication of transplant is this complication called graft versus host disease. This is where a child may be cured of their primary disease, but still die after their transplant because the T cells that we uh, include in the graft attack the, uh, the child's body and they can die from that terrible complication called graft versus host disease. The, uh, Oops. Um, the good news is, is that our uh, our stem cell transplant program is is opening trials and has opened trials to address these major barriers. And what I'm going to do for you today is really just tell you some stories about what we're doing to defeat the barriers to success after transplant and cellular therapies. I'm going to tell you three trial stories that are all really exciting coming out of our stem cell transplant program. So the first really addresses this uh, most uh, a common cause of failure after transplant, which is primary disease relapse. So if a child has ALL or AML, it means their leukemia comes back despite their transplant. And this is a particular problem in patients with AML. We often see patients that are uh, transplanted for AML for whom uh, their disease relapses after transplant. And this is where our our stem cell transplant field and the CAR T cell field are really merging. So I'm highlighting work by one of our young investigators, Susanna Baumeister, who does a lot of our work with CAR T cells. And she and I are part of a very unique collaboration that's only open in five sites around the country where we are combining CAR T cells against AML with stem cell transplant to cure this disease. And these CAR T cells are really uh, cutting edge, very innovative CAR T cells that, that um, are against a major antigen or protein that's expressed on AML cells called CD33. And mouse studies have been really amazing, really uh, um, convincing that when uh, mice that are given AML, so on the left-hand side, don't get their CAR T cells, their leukemia takes over their body. But when mice are given the CD33 CARs, they can be cured of their leukemia. This is really a major advance and it has led to a first in disease and first in child uh, trial that we are helping to lead. Now, when you, uh, when you um, attack the CD33 antigen, it is a situation where if you don't give a transplant after that CAR T cell, the patient would never recover their own marrow. And so this is a great example of a, of a marriage between the new technology of CAR T cells and our expertise in stem cell transplant. And this cartoon shows you sort of the, the way the trial is set up that we have opened here at, uh, at uh, uh, Boston Children's in Dana-Farber, where uh, in phase one of the study, the, the patients are screened uh, to make sure they're eligible for the trial. In phase two, they get an apheresis, as Dr. Silverman talked about, and they, we manufacture this, this car. This is done at the National Cancer Institute. Phase three, they're given lymphodepletion, they're given their car, and then they follow right after that with a transplant. And the hope is that this will totally uh, destroy their AML cells and the, and the transplant will allow them to grow back uh, with normal bone marrow. And we're really excited that this is now open at the Dana-Farber and Boston Children's Hospital. The second trial I want to highlight, again, highlights a young investigator, Dr. Jennifer Wangbo, who is an expert at that bad complication of transplant that I told you about. So if we're gonna do the trial with the CD33 car and then the bone marrow transplant, we've gotta make sure that those kids that we cure their AML don't develop this bad complication called GVHD. And one of the worst types of GVHD is called chronic GVHD. And you can think about it as a terrible autoimmune disease. So here's a picture, this is an, of an adult that has this disease. And you can see his arms are sort of held at this odd angle. It's because he can't actually extend his arms because his skin is so tight. It actually can affect every part of your body. It can look like diabetes. You can have uh, failure to be able to uh, produce insulin because of it. Your liver can fail because of it. Your skin uh, can become very abnormal because of it. And it is the, it is the worst cause of late uh, morbidity and mortality in our patients. 
Well, Jennifer Wangbo happens to be one of the experts in this, and we're using another kind of immunotherapy. This is a cellular therapy, not to attack cancer, but actually to help improve the sort of uh, regulation of our body after, after transplant. And so this graphic shows you that normally after transplant or often after transplant, you've got a lot more of what we call effector T cells or GVHD causing T cells than those good regulatory T cells. And what that can lead to is this situation called graft versus host disease. But what, but what Jennifer has done is perfected in the lab a way to create and expand regulatory T cells uh, from the donor of a patient to tip that balance so that instead of causing GVHD, um, you get successful treatment and you can either prevent the chronic GVHD from happening or treat it. And I want to just show you this picture. This is a this is a young uh, lady that I took care of several years ago, who sort of gives you that 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 real sort of personal kind of look of what chronic GVHD and its successful treatment. Uh, can look at. If you look on the left, her dad, who was just a wonderful guy and basically carried her around the, the hospital for a year is making a funny face at us. This young lady spent a year in the hospital with complications for a chronic GVHD. We were eventually able to switch that regulatory balance. And you can see on the right, uh, this happy happy young lady uh, going uh, to fourth grade. And I think this is this is what we keep at the forefront of our minds, being able to take those kids and really try to at least either prevent them from having to spend such long days in the hospital uh, with these terrible complications or to successfully treat them if they occur. So we're opening up, this is a first ever trial. This is only going to be at Dana-Farber, a trial that we call EVE for ex vivo expanded Tregs. This is built on Jennifer Wangbo's uh, long history of studying of, of GBHD. And we're gonna give those uh, ex vivo expanded Tregs to patients who get chronic GBHD in hopes that we can rapidly turn around this disease and, and cure our kids of this bad complication of transplant. And then finally, I want to highlight work of another young investigator in our group, Uli Gerdeman. And she's really doing, I think, what, what Dana-Farber does best, which is not only thinking about how do we cure these kids, how do we make these clinical trials, but how do we figure out the biology of either success or failure of these, of these uh, new cellular therapeutics. So, she, so the, I titled this section, Digging Deep into the Biology of the CAR T Cells to Ensure Cure, through this study we call the PREDICT trial. And what this study is all about is taking those CAR T cells that Lewis introduced in his talk and, and not only uh, taking care of the children, but also digging deep into what is in the product that we're getting from those CAR T cells in the blood and the bone marrow. And then in patients that receive those CAR T cells, studying in depth their blood and their bone marrow to try to figure out what are the biologic correlates of success or failure with these cells. And very similar to what Scott showed you, this new single cell technology, in our research group, we um, have worked hard to develop this for the study of CAR T cells. And so what you can see in this sort of um, a diagram on the right are clusters of cells that identify the products that we give the cells, the cells, that how they look when they're maximally proliferating in the patient and then when they contract. And by determining how these differ in patients that go on to be long-term survivors from CAR T cells versus those patients that we really want to learn how to avoid, those that, that uh, relapse after CAR T cells, we are going to take the necessary steps forward to continue to iterate in this field and to create more and more successful cellular therapies. So I consider this to be an incredibly important initiative, one that Dana-Farber is uniquely positioned to really make strides in. And again, I want to highlight that Uli, a young uh, MD, PhD in our program, is leading the charge here. And so I'll end with just reminding you of the three stories that I told you about. I told you about three stories using cellular therapies combined with uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, um, Suzanne Baumeister's trial where we're uh, attempting to decrease uh, relapse in patients with AML with CD33 CAR T cells uh, linked to stem cell transplantation. Jennifer Wangbo's where we're looking to treat that worst complication of transplant, chronic GVHD, again with the cellular therapy. And then Uli Gerdeman's work digging deep into the biology of CAR T cell success to ensure all patients are cured. And with that, uh, I'll take uh, any questions.
Hi. Um, anybody with who are um, in the audience or participating have a particular question? Otherwise, um, are there any diseases beyond leukemia that you think um, we'll try some of the CAR T cell therapy on? Um, yeah, maybe I'll take that, Lewis. We actually are, are uh, very actively looking at other diseases. For instance, Suzanne Baumeister, who I highlighted today, is also involved with uh, uh, one of our physicians, Susie Schusterman, if, that is an expert in neuroblastoma, and they are moving forward a, a CAR T cell that is going to be directed against an antigen that patients with neuroblastoma express called ALK. And that hopefully will be opening soon. And that's just one of the, of the many potential non-leukemia cars that we're trying to develop. Okay, should we, uh, Allison, should we move on? Or do you have another question? Um. Do you anticipate perhaps any um, treatments one day that may not be as difficult on um, children that have a lot of um, side effects and impact um, as they get older? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's really um, what we're hoping, you know, uh, I think I, I emphasized uh, with these new therapies that are, one of the, the great goals is to improve cure rates, which is absolutely true, but many of them are less toxic um, than our currently available therapies. And I think another hope of ours is that we can use these therapies to substitute for some of the more toxic components of treatment uh, and uh, be able to reduce the short and long-term side effects of the treatments we're giving. So a drug like blinatumumab, which is an antibody really um, has far fewer side effects than, than any chemotherapy agent. We are unaware of any long-term side effects with it. It appears to be effective. And I think what we're trying to figure out is, is how do you incorporate that into upfront treatment of kids who are already cured? Because what we want to do is make sure that we don't disrupt the cure rate, but we really want to improve the quality of the cure as well. well this is a great segue into our next speaker, Conrad. Yeah, do you? I think I'll I'll take it from here. I, I want to first um, <clears throat> refer back to uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong. Um, I want to thank you, Scott, for uh, kicking off our program this afternoon and for giving us uh, the, the opening comments and a lot of insightful things to, to think about. It spurred a few good questions as well. So I thank you for that. I also I uh, want to thank Dr. Silverman and Dr. Keen uh, for their wonderful presentations and for the couple of questions that we had there as well for them. Um, it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Lisa Silverman. Uh, I hope she has arrived um, and is waiting, um, who has been a leader and instrumental voice uh, at Dana-Farber for over three decades in treatment, uh, in the treatment of childhood cancer. Um, she is a wonderful and world expert in the treatment of neuroblastoma, genetic risk and prevention, and survivorship. Uh, and I will make this comment, Lisa, uh, I've been doing this with Allison now and the committee since it started some eight years or so ago, and I've known you for uh, being involved with the board for over a decade. So when I heard, when I saw in my comments that I was introducing you with 30 years of experience with Dana, well, <clears throat> I've been around for 10 of those and I've been introducing you for the last eight years. So without any further ado, Lisa, uh, thank you for your leadership and for joining us today. Can you hear me? I can. Great. And can my uh, panelists join us? Yes. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the session. I'm usually um, there bright and early with everyone, but I was delivering a talk to another group. 
um, earlier. I'm thrilled to be leading a panel today on childhood cancer survivorship. You're absolutely right. This is that was a great lead in to what we'll be talking about. When I, I, I it makes me feel so old, but when I started at the Dana Farber, there was no survivorship program. Um, children who were cured of their cancer had been told by Dr. Farber and others back in the 70s um, that they should never stop coming to the Jimmy Funk Clinic. And if they had a problem, they should come in the afternoon and see a doctor. And one day, one of them was me. I was a trainee. I knew nothing. And this young man came in and had um, this was in the years of paper charts, had paper charts about sort of this thick and had had Hodgkin's disease as a teenager, as a young teenager, and was now in his 30s and had a myriad of uh, problems from his treatment, from his radiation, including hypothyroidism, from the fact that his spleen had been removed and put him at risk for um, infection, from the fact that he... Um, had had uh, chemotherapy that left him without sperm and he had used a sperm donor to have children. And I got to thinking there must be a better way than having someone like me who knows nothing see these patients as they walk in. And I went to my boss at the time and said, hey, maybe we should have a survivorship program. And they said, sure, go ahead. And lucky me, um, I was able to uh, interact with, recruit, and uh, work with a number of incredibly talented people who have made the survivorship program here at the Dana-Farber in pediatrics, one of the premier ones in the country, and have had the wonderful experience of having um, philanthropic support in particular from the Prini family, as well as from many other supporters, the McKinsey family, who I know are here and others. Please excuse me if I don't name all the names. But it really has been a labor of love, both for the physicians, nurses, um, and uh, psychologists and other professionals who work in the clinic, a labor of love for the parents who take care of their children who are survivors, who get them through those teenage years, wondering what happened to me, mom, why did you do this to me, and why do I have to keep going to the doctor, and for the philanthropists and the people who support us, who have been so wonderfully supportive of our program. I hope that our three panelists will be able to answer your questions as well as mine. I'm kind of pitching in to ask some questions, uh, to get some questions started, but please add your questions to the Q&A. I think I'll start with Linda. Linda Vrooman is the medical director of the David B. Perini Junior Quality of Life Clinic, our survivorship clinic. Linda is also an expert in leukemia and spends a lot of her time thinking about that last question that Lewis just answered. How do we go from the leukemia therapy that we know left children with many long-term side effects to therapy that's here today? And what does that mean for survivorship care? Does it make it easier? Does it change the way we take care of survivors? Tell us what happens, Linda. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to talk about our survivorship program. And to introduce myself a little bit, my clinical and research focus has been on understanding and minimizing um, treatment-related toxicities, particularly in ALL. I'm a pediatric oncologist specializing in our hematologic malignancy program, but then I'm lucky to serve as the medical director of the Perini Clinic. We're helping to direct the care of our childhood cancer survivors in hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. So as you mentioned, the Prini Clinic provides multidisciplinary consultative care to survivors of childhood cancer across the age spectrum. And each survivor is evaluated by a multidisciplinary team based on individual risks and needs. Comprehensive visits include education and review of treatment summaries and updated survivorship care plans so our survivors know what to think about and what to do. We consider in detail with survivors the treatment they've received and how that can impact their health and well being moving forward. And we advise on appropriate screening and health interventions. We pay particular attention, as you mentioned, to supporting survivors at important transitions, especially as children become adolescents and young adults more in charge of their own health care. Because of the advances in childhood ALL that we were hearing about, there are increasing numbers of survivors of this disease, um, but those survivors could have multiple long-term issues. 
Um, and we have learned a lot about many of them, but there's still a lot more to do. As an example, early in my training as a pediatric oncologist, I took care of adolescents being treated for leukemia who develop terrible joint complications called osteonecrosis that can result in collapse of joints and the need for surgical interventions such as joint replacement, really serious consequence, consequences for treatment in young survivors. We learned in dana barber AL trials that the use of dexmethasone, a particular steroid, was more associated with this toxicity but resulted in better cure rates of leukemia. And even still, not enough is known about how to prevent and treat this complication. So in order to address this, in order to learn more about the impact on um, survivors, I'm leading an inter international collaborative effort, assembling data on what we think is the largest number of cases of osteonecrosis in order to better understand this toxicity and to hopefully result in better prevention and management. And then we've taken this information and changed how we treat children right now, decreasing steroid exposure when we can, when that's feasible. And then also I work with, and my colleagues do as well, work with other national and international experts, for example, in bone health to create guidelines for care of childhood cancer survivors to monitor and protect, in my case, bone health. But we do this across multiple toxicities. Um, we have similar efforts underway with um, cardiac toxicity, for example, in a collaboration with the Children's Oncology Group to understand cardiac function decades after treatment for childhood ALL, ALL on our treatment protocols. But we, as we were hearing, we know that with the advances and with new treatments being added and developing into our practice, we're going to continue to need to understand what the long-term impact of currently novel treatments are. And this will be important work for us moving forward so that we can also help to improve those new treatments and also to provide the best possible care for future survivors. I think I'll, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. I know my colleagues have a lot to add. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to come back to you and ask you some more questions, so don't go anywhere, okay? Now I want to introduce Tab Cooney. You might mention, you might notice when you meet people who work at the Dana-Farber that many of us have been here 20, 30 years. No one ever leaves. So it's such a breath of fresh air to have someone new who trained elsewhere and came to join us here in Boston. Tab recently joined our faculty from coming here from California and joining us to work as a brain tumor doctor and develop our brain tumor survivorship program also known as the Stop and Shop program. Um, Tab, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on the challenges of taking care of brain tumor survivors, especially childhood cancer brain tumor survivors, pediatric brain tumor survivors, who get therapy at such sort of developmentally crucial moments in their lives and that it might interrupt their development, might, I assume, makes that care very challenging. I wonder what, you know, if you could just reflect on how you work as a clinician in that setting, and then also what you think the sort of most important research questions that need to be answered to help your work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I will say it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's very weird that I can't see any of you in the audience. Um, and it's wonderful and weird to be in a blazer and sweatpants. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm the director of the, the Pediatric Brain and Spinal Cord Tumor Program, as Lisa said. So um, second to leukemia, pediatric brain and spinal cord tumors are the second most common type of cancer of childhood. Uh, we know roughly three in four children who develop a brain and spinal cord tumor become what we call a long-term survivor. We know that many of them ultimately do face either recurrence or a secondary tumor or a stroke. And we know that nearly most of them face some amount of difficulty in how they learn, how they grow, how they control and regulate their emotions and or how they move their body. Um, so I think many people like me who do what I do see it as our mission to not only develop cures for pediatric brain and spinal cord tumors, but to move these children through their cancer journey in a way that positions them to have as much potential for health and happiness in their adult life as they would have had otherwise. Um, and that takes a lot of, I think it's going to take a lot of creativity, a lot of collaboration. So in terms of how our clinical program runs, I would say we have a very holistic multidisciplinary approach um, to treating the child as they become a teenager, as they become a young adult. Um, there's people like me who have a focus in neuro-oncology, but there's our neurologists, our psychologists, our neuropsychiatrists, and our school liaison people. Um, we try to have every provider meet with the patient in order to focus on every aspect of their cognitive health, 
mental, emotional, physical. Um, we're doing that even through COVID. So it, it is taking creativity, it's taking some technology um, learning, but we are, we are attempting via in-person or virtual to still provide that multidisciplinary care. Um, similar to our clinical program, I would say our research is not spanning even just across disciplines, but across Harvard institutions. Um, in an attempt, like Christopher is going to explain, and as Linda has said, um, trying to get us to better prevent, um, understand, and mitigate the detrimental effects that happen later on down the road. Thanks so much, Chad. That's great. Appreciate that. Sure. And then last, but certainly not least, is a colleague of mine, Christopher Replitis, who's a psychologist and a re uh, researcher who works on um, behavioral interventions and understanding the toll that um, cancer therapy and cancer survivorship take, um, takes emotionally on our patients, in particular, coming up with interventions to mitigate those. Um, Christopher, tell us about your work a little bit and where you see the field going. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so it, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today and to be able to talk about the, the work uh, that we do together. And I have to say the work that, that Lisa has really led here and nationally for all of us to work, uh, to create a center that we can work together. It's just been a great opportunity to, to be part of. Um, so I'm a clinical psychologist. So my professional interests are in the area of psychological adjustment of children and young adults after their treatment for cancer. Uh, the good news is, you know, we know that most of our survivors are end up going to be well adjusted, um, but we know as a group that they do have risk for emotional learning, other late effects that can interfere with their adjustment and their achievement of developmental milestones. So part of my work is clinical. I see patients in the Perini Clinic um, providing some of the care that people described uh, virtually these days, uh, which has been interesting as, as Tab noted, um, and also training psychologists uh, to, to take over uh, for, for the future when I'm not here doing this direct service work myself. Um, a lot of my time, most of my time is spent doing research, as Lisa indicated, trying to understand more about psychological adjustment of our survivors. And I, I think there's really three kinds of work that we do. Part of it is looking at the causes of um, psychological aid effects, trying to understand why most patients do well and some patients don't. Recently had an opportunity working with a, a fellow of ours to look at some genetic predispositions to that. So we heard a lot about genetic predispositions and other aspects of cancer care. We're also looking at how genetics may help explain why some people develop psychological um, problems and issues after treatment and others don't. Um, a, a lot of our work is actually, uh, a lot of my funded research um, has been looking at trying to identify the, uh, the survivors who have psychological complications who need more intervention. It's, I mean, it's great news that, you know, 70, 80% of our survivors are doing well, but it then becomes a clinical task of how do we find the 20, 25, 30% who need more help? And how do we do it quickly? Because our patients are not coming to clinic every week, thank goodness, um, as they did during treatment. But when you see a young adult once a year, how do you figure that out as part of their visit, whether they need more or not? Um, and then finally, as Lisa indicated, a lot of the work that we've been doing in the last few years is trying to develop interventions. So if we know what the problems are, and we know how to identify the people who need help, what do we do for them? Um, and this has been really gratifying, I think, in the last few years to be able to work more on issues like sleep problems, sexual health problems, um, anxiety, and depression. And a lot of our work is really taking what's known about helping young adults in the general population with things like insomnia or anxiety and depression and adjusting it, tweaking it both to so it, it fits young adults, cancer survivors with their other general medical issues, which they may have, um, and also fits their age and their preferences for receiving information. A lot of our patients have seen a lot of doctors, they've been to a lot of hospitals, when you come in and say, hey, we have, you know, 18 sessions of this there, it's a lot for them because we're not the only piece of the pie, right? They have other physical health issues going on. So we really need to work closely uh, with the oncologist, both as we do in the clinic, uh, but also in terms of uh, our behavioral health interventions to make sure they make sense broadly with everything else that's going on with our survivors. I guess I'll stop there. That's great, Christopher. So here's the inevitable COVID question, which I know, Tab, you touched on. Um, Linda, 
how are you doing survivorship clinic now that we can't see patients in person or or is it a good thing do we reach more survivors because we now have zoom tell me what you think we moved really quickly and i hope pivoted as quickly as we could to moving our um our clinic to be a fully virtual clinic doing video visits virtually um, with our patients. And we assembled our team and implemented that as quickly as we could and have seen over 100, 200 case, uh, patients in this way. And it's we hope that it's been successful. Um, Christopher can speak to this as well, but to make sure that we were still giving our patients what we needed, we have been um, doing patient satisfaction and actually getting provider input systematically so we can make sure that what we're doing in this short time frame, um, we're able to do the best we can for our survivors. We've learned a few things. We've learned that uh, this kind of offering of a virtual um, visit for survivorship has a lot of things that are great. It allows us to really provide some education in a format that can be really convenient for people. And it helps us to help people in real time when coming into the major center here may not be ideal. We've also learned that there are some things that we can't do as well. <laughs> I think we've all felt that in different parts of our arts, parts of our lives and we're helping and we're really trying to identify the patients who we really do need to bring in and talk with in person. Um, so I think that we've we're trying to do the best we can, and hopefully some of these lessons will take us forward so that we can have more reach and reach more, reach more survivors, because it is hard for some people to uh, access survivorship care. That's great. Um, Christopher, what about research? Have you been able to use technology um, in ways to get the research or to keep the research going? Uh, yeah, so we have been able to keep the research going with old school technology and new school technology. Um, the new school technology, I would say, I was very fortunate the, in the middle of everything, as Linda's saying, pivoting very quickly. Um, I found myself with an NCI funded study to look at um, health behaviors in young adult cancer survivors that was designed from the beginning to be done entirely online. So that, that study obviously went forward almost completely as predicted. Um, there were some materials we didn't have on hand, but fortunately because we've, we've known for years that young adults like to do things online. So we have online interventions, we have online groups, and this intervention study was designed to be done online. Um, so that was the new school. The old school technology, I could, if I lean off camera, I have a bag here of forms and questionnaires, uh, which I've been mailing to people and going into the office and receiving, and we've figured out new ways to get the data entered and cleaned and scored. So, you know, part of pivoting is people being flexible and doing things they didn't think they would be doing um, a few months ago. But we have, we've sent out hundreds of surveys to um, young adults. We have a research uh, cohort of um, survivors who are treated at Dana-Farber. We follow over 800 patients. Um, who are treated. We've been following many of them for 10 years or more. We also follow 700, uh, several hundred parents as well. And I think all four of us have participated in publications or research that comes out of Project REACH. So it's been important for us to keep in touch with those folks. Um, and mailed surveys and emails and other ways uh, have, have still been going out and coming back in. Um, and uh, we have found that you know some things have actually been easier. So um, working with certain statisticians, working with certain people um, when you don't have to be physically together, I think um, has been faster. It's, it's forced us to do things honestly, things that we've wanted to do for years, but we didn't quite have time to create the technology or create the websites. Suddenly it was do or die. And so we found ourselves doing things in 2020 we thought we weren't going to do it until 2025. So it, it hasn't been easy, but it, a lot of good work got done. Great, thank you. And speaking of cohorts, um, you know, the Dana-Farber is a member of a large childhood cancer cohort of, of over 30,000 survivors who were treated um, throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and who have faithfully filled in questionnaires and provided their medical records for us to know what happens to them over time. And members uh, all of my colleagues here and members of the faculty at Dana-Farber have been leaders in this group in analyzing the data or coming up with ways we should understand the data better. Tab, can you talk about how that data might be helpful for brain tumor survivors um, from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, maybe around second cancers or other issues that they might um, face? Absolutely. Um, I, I think our, our partnership with the uh, Childhood Cancer Survivor Study um, is phenomenal. Uh, I would say 
So right now we're trying to uh, apark, embark upon a revisitation of um, secondary meningiomas, which is something that many pediatric brain tumor survivors acquire um, if they've had radiation as part of their treatment. Um, but now that we've had decades and decades of experience, um, we're able to visit that in great detail in a way that hope, hopefully will allow us to understand the real risk for these people as the decades go on, and that will better inform how we survey them, um, the timing of our scans, whether we give scans, um, in a way that also mitigates the morbidity of, of these meningiomas. That's something specifically that our team's doing um, fairly soon. That's great. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, a question came in about CAR T therapy and late effects. You know, I think, Linda, you touched upon the fact that it is so important for us to not uh, be playing catch up 20 years from now when we have hopefully long term survivors of these new therapies, genetic therapies and other therapies, tech targeted therapies, immunotherapies, and that we really are able to follow those patients going forward in very organized ways so that we don't have to go looking for 30,000 survivors 20 years from now to say what happened. Do we know anything about late effects of CAR-T therapy yet? And how would you propose us to study those patients? Well, I think this is a really important issue, CAR-T therapy, some of the other agents that were being discussed, inotuzumab, linotuzumab, when they're getting incorporated with other treatments, what will that mean? Um, and this really is an important opportunity for us to continue to lead it in survivorship. Um, and what it's going to take is really a systematic collecting of data, which is not always the most fun thing to talk about, but it is really important uh, because because we, we need to make sure that we're collecting data as we move forward. Already there's efforts on that on the trials that patients are on, but for the longer term, sometimes um, the data collection falls off. And so that's something that we, we will be working on and are working to think about the best way to collect this data moving forward. We are sure to collect treatment summaries. We do that already for patients and that's another avenue. We do make treatment summaries for all patients. And so that might be a way for us to, to start this work, but it's a huge and important opportunity. I, I'm thinking also of a medication, which is no longer new, imatinib, but that's been used for the treatment of CML. Um, and in pediatric CML has revolutionized its care where patients no longer really need transplants but are on um, this agent for decades. Um, and we don't really know what it means to be a young, young person at age four to be diagnosed with this disease and be on this agent for decades. And I think uh, Tab, there's, um, instances of this in treating um, patients with brain tumors as well. So this is an area that we really will need to continue to innovate on so that we can make sure we have these answers for our next population of survivors. Um, a question that came up that I'm gonna extend a little bit further is how the Perini Clinic um, coordinates with the Adult Survivorship Program. Um, I know there's a lot of different points of coordination. Christopher, do you wanna talk a tiny bit about um, coordination in terms of research? Sure. Um, so I think that there is a fair amount of coordination um, on the research side, some of it formal and some of it informal. So many of us who have done research um, on the pediatric side also do research with the Adult Survivorship Program. So for example, I've worked on research studies um, with prostate cancer survivors, and I've worked on you know, cancer survivors uh, for you know insomnia. Part of that is because survivorship really, uh, the study of survivorship really started in pediatrics, and so many of us who work in pediatrics have early experience with doing survivorship studies, the measures of you know, the late effects, the things you might look at. Um, so we, that certainly happens both on an informal and formal basis in terms of you know, having funded studies where people, people from both pediatric and survivorship worlds work together. Um, Anne Partridge, who leads the adult survivorship program, and I have also organized research symposia, symposiums um, over the last few years, which have brought together um, researchers from the New England area. And so we've had, I think, three or four of those at this point, um, which is another way of bringing people uh, together. And obviously, there's a lot, the, uh, there's a great deal of difference in terms of the diseases and the treatments. Um, and yet, some of the issues for researchers, whether it's looking at late effects, looking at sexual health outcomes, um, trying to understand ways of uh, keeping in touch with our survivors over time, as, as Linda was talking about. Uh, those things are, really go across diseases and across ages. So I, I think that we have had 
um, those uh, that work it does happen. And Linda, do you want to say a word about coordinating between adult and pediatric? Um, certainly. Um, from a clinical perspective, it's important to have the expertise in it in both of these areas here at Dana Farber, we do have uh, Dr. Nagadov, Larissa Nagadov, who is an adult internist who works with us in the pediatric survivorship program and also is a bridge to the adult survivorship program, taking care of adults, survivors of adult cancers. And so she conferences with us and sees patients with us so that we can make sure that we are all um, kind of moving forward together. And then our survivors in the pediatric program have access to the resources in the, what, in the adult program. That means adult um, uh, um, cardio-oncology um, other specialists, so that there is a lot of collaboration and we make sure that what is available can be available for all of our patients. Um, Tab, I know that um, you are quite interested in kind of um, understanding what the biology of uh, the outcomes are of having a childhood brain tumor and understanding how the stress of having a childhood brain tumor might affect the outcome either from that brain tumor or from survivorship. I wonder if you could touch on that in terms of what funding would be helpful to pursue that kind of work and um, where you would think you'd want to go next with that sort of question? Uh, any and all funding. <laughs> um, I think of how, I, how to frame this best, Lisa. So I, I do think there is obviously, you know, a, a different, slightly different playing field for my kids um, who have tumors in their brain. I, when they get this treatment, I think we're dealing with a multifaceted trauma that occurs. We're dealing with a mechanical trauma of a tumor in the brain and the surgery that's involved. Um, we're dealing with a chemical trauma that, that is the chemotherapy we have to deliver, the radiation therapy we have to deliver to see them into adulthood. And then there is this existential experiential trauma that all of these children face and their families. Um, I think they all converge in a way that is specific to the age of the child and the situation of the child um, that sets in motion a rewiring um, and a rebalance of chemicals and ultimately contributes to these intellectual difficulties we see, these emotional, psychological difficulties we see. Um, so what I would like Dana-Farber to do is be at the, the forefront of measuring the correlates to this in a way that's as objective as possible. Um, I think that, like I mentioned before, we'll take cross collaboration, but I think of what can we measure or what should we try to measure to better understand this. I think there's going to be very sophisticated imaging that's involved um, amongst you know, collaborators I've already connected to, but funding would be very helpful for. Um, sophisticated neuroimaging, hopefully blood markers and possibly some cerebrospinal fluid markers as well. But it's going to take a, a, a very um, collaborative effort and attempt to measure this and then to get a patient population that's measuring it over a period of time. Um, what we're trying to do right now, just to, just to shamelessly plug this, is, is develop a, an exercise study similar to what Dana Farber is initiating for their breast cancer patients. Um, that allows our young adult children to exercise um, in a virtual space for a prolonged period of time, similar to Peloton, um, and that will try to measure uh, both through brain imaging and through blood biomarkers um, the amount of stress that they have leading into it and then the effects that happen post-intervention and then that follow-up. Um, this, is, this is something that's already, we are setting in motion and we are developing, but we would very much very much need funding for to really make happen. But I think if, if this is feasible and we're able to accomplish this, there's many more um, questions we, we can seek and, and I think a lot of good we can do. Great. Um, I'm happy to call on someone who's apparently raising his hand. Ooh. John? Yes, Lisa, can you hear me? I can. That's John. Right. Well, first of all, I, I, uh, I lost my connection, so hopefully you didn't answer these, this question. Uh, while I was struggling with connectivity. But um, I just want to know, could you speak a little bit about how you balance various challenges that the, that the clinic faces? You know, for example, assisting current survivors of diseases in the past, uh, thinking about how new treats and treatments will create future survivorship challenges, working with doctors that are driving new treatments to prevent uh, future challenges. 
How, how do you think about balancing those things? Well, that, that is such a great question. I think, you know, one of the things that makes me most proud actually is um, that I um, am the principal investigator on a study of um, high risk neuroblastoma survivors. High risk neuroblastoma is a disease that had a very, very low survivorship rate when I started my career. And now it's a little, uh, it's not great, but it's about 50 to 60% of children diagnosed with that disease expect to be long term survivors. So we're finally able to do a study of those survivors. But the other thing that makes me incredibly proud is for children with low and intermediate risk neuroblastoma, you don't really need to know what those things are, they sort of mean what they say, is that we have reduced therapy using clinical trials over the years, not because the therapy wasn't successful, the therapy was very successful, but the late effects were not tolerable and they were done as what we call reduction of therapy studies. So at the same time, we had to intensify study therapy in order to get survivors. And now we have a group of survivors who are quite affected by their therapy and really need survivorship care and we really need better treatments. And on the other hand, we have kids getting so little therapy that they get graduated from survivorship clinic because they don't really need to see a survivorship doctor. So we really are sort of balancing it at the level of the clinical trials that we do for sure. The question around how we balance kids who had older therapies, if you will, and are quite devastated by their therapies and newer therapies is a difficult one, but I think actually we kind of learn, thankfully, that the patients who come back who have those difficult times, we learn from them and we learn to use what we see in those patients to take care of modern patients, to know whether the reductions in therapies that we've achieved actually worked, to know what to measure. So um, I don't know, Linda, maybe you could talk about that a little bit in ALL, right? I mean, cognitive outcomes in leukemia patients because of cranial radiation Absolutely. are concerning, but we took away a lot of that radiation and it got better, but Linda? Exactly. So, I mean, I think that's a really great example. We've known that cranial radiation can prevent uh, leukemia from coming back in the spinal fluid. That's not what we want. We know that that can work, but it can have a lot of long-term consequences to the vasculature, to neurocognitive status. And so over time, we've slowly and slowly reduced um, the number of patients receiving cranial radiation. And now it's very, very few, just the few who we now have learned really need it. And that was work done here and collaborating um, internationally to have that knowledge. But that doesn't mean that the story's over. We, in order to achieve those cures, we had to increase the therapy called intrathecal therapy, therapy directly into the spinal fluid. And by doing so, we still know that there are long-term neurocognitive potential outcomes. And so that's when in survivorship clinic, we have to work collaboratively. We work with uh, Christopher to understand what people's needs are when they're seeing patients. We have the school liaison program to help families interact with the schools so that we can really best support our our patients moving forward. So even when we make a change, and even when that changes for the better, it doesn't mean that the story's over and we still need to continue to work with our survivors and learn from our survivors and listen to them so that when they are having issues or new issues or issues that we think shouldn't be there anymore, we're, re we're ready to pivot again and to, to learn and to help. Thanks a lot, Linda. I want to thank the time being, I'm getting the cane. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, the three of you. Nothing could make me more proud than to be working with the three of you and to see our program flourish. Um, thank you so much to the uh, attendees and I'll turn it over to Allison and Conrad. Hi. All right, Allison. That was wonderful. And I really think that John's question and um, the summary of Lisa and the panelists um, highlights how exciting the work is and multidisciplinary, the di interdisciplinary approach that the pediatric program has at Dana-Farber for treating our pa pediatric patients and the survivors and also with the collaboration with the adult programs here. Um, very exciting program. On behalf of all attendees, I want to thank the faculty for sharing their time and important work with us. It's inspiring and brings hope to the continued efforts to prevent and treat cancers in young patients. 
Thank you for taking the time to prepare for today's meetings. We know you all have such incredibly busy schedules. In addition, we owe a big thank you to Todd and his team who worked tirelessly all year to bring such informative and rewarding programs. And of course, I wanna thank Conrad who pointed out we have now been co-hosting for seven years. Conrad and I wanna use our remaining time to open up the discussion to share your thoughts and takeaways from the day. Please use the Q&A box or raise your hand and we'll either try to ask your question for you or call on you. In addition though, if you could please, um, um, if you could please use the chat box to share any topics or areas of interest you'd like to hear more about in the future. But I also, um, so does anyone wanna begin? Okay, any questions out there? I know Lisa, uh, uh, high five to you. Uh, you did a great job in, uh, I think collecting some additional questions from the audience. Uh, but now's the time to kind of, for all of us, uh, to kind of reflect on what we've heard over the last two hours, uh, one and a half hours or so, and uh, uh, give us your thoughts on uh, today and what you heard. And what you might wanna hear in the future. Absolutely. Scott? Yeah, is it cheating if I if I say something? Yeah. No, sir. No, this is open for the whole group. I, I just, first of all, I just want to say that I really love the, this, all the discussion. It's much better than talking about how COVID's impacted things. Um, but, you know, the discussion around survivorship, I alluded to this in one of the comments that I made. There's another opportunity, and, and Lisa mentioned it as well, that there's a lot of interest on the adult side in um, early detection and prevention of cancer, which is uh, tremendously exciting. It, these patients that are survivors of our therapies are also at significant risk for the development of, of second cancers. And this gives us an opportunity to think about how in the pediatric space, pediatric cancer space, we can think about early detection and prevention as well. Um, and Lisa and I talk about this a lot, um, but it's an area that I suspect we're gonna hear a lot more about in, in the next few years. And as we learn more about the genetics of predisposition, well, that will also very likely enlighten the genetics of secondary effects or second effect, uh, long-term effects as well. So this is all coming together, meaning the genetics the therapies and the long-term side effects and prevention um, and kind of gets to one of the discussion points about the fact that it just forces us to make sure we're talking to each other a lot, which I guess maybe we've learned a little bit better how to do in the past few months. Um, but th that's an area where I think we'll be hearing a lot in the, in the next few years. Um yeah, and, and it's interesting that you bring that up, Scott, because um, there's a question from Richard about um, wanting to hear in the future about genetic predisposition research. You know, one of the ways we think about genetic predisposition, obviously, is predisposition to cancer. But as Christopher mentioned, there's, you know, genetics may determine some of the late toxicities that we see in patients as well. I imagine that in the not too distant future, we'll, um, be treating children with um, a diagnosis of cancer with drugs that are specifically selected for them because they do or don't have a risk of a particular side effect, let's say hearing loss. One of the drugs that we use a lot in pediatrics is a platinum drug that can be very associated with the onset of, of hearing loss or even deafness. And probably there is a genetic susceptibility to that. We don't quite understand it yet, but I, I would put money on that we will. I, I missed the morning talk, but I bet 
Scott brought up that there's so much data. And what we need is to be able to really smartly look at that data. Genetics generates a ton of data, but we need people and uh, funding to support those people to dig deeply into that data to help inform clinical work. And that even includes survivorship, not just how do we cure patients, but how do we cure them with fewer side effects? Now, would you ever see, especially in pediatrics, when people um, are really situated in their family um, situation with their parents, do you see having access to the parental genetics in any um, way being linked, not to make the chain any longer? We, we do do that a lot now. It's kind of a change in our standards of care. I would say five years ago, we were very nervous about testing children and then figuring out what implications that has on the rest of the family. And we've kind of really, because of, I assume, a little bit cultural changes, uh, the ways in which people understand genetics, um, the availability and reliability of genetic testing, even the cost of genetic testing as it's gone down, we've become much more open to the idea that cancer can be a family disease, can run in families, as you heard about this morning, and that it's our job to look for that. It's not the most common situation in any cancer, um, but in some cancers, um, it is, you know, some rare childhood tumors, it is quite prominent feature. And overall, probably somewhere around 10, maybe more, as we understand the genetics better, 10% or so of our children will have an identifiable marker that could run in their family. And we do extend out to family members. I work with Judy Garber, who you heard from this morning, and we're developing a family predisposition program so that we can see the whole family right now on Zoom, but eventually in a room together and um, and get the whole family history at one time and get the testing done as needed. Okay, I think, uh, Allison, we need to wrap up. Uh, I'm getting the hook. What an and, afternoon. Uh, we need to pull it all together here. Who, who just said something? Allison. I just said what an inspiring oh. afternoon. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. Thank you all again, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Scott, for jumping in. And thanks to the rest of the audience that I can't see. It's the weirdest thing, you know, talking to this screen or a blank, you know, and you're, you don't know who's out there. I like to see my audience. <laughs> but thank you all for your thoughtful comments and questions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, should you have any follow-up questions on the content that was provided, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of the presenters directly. Their emails are, yeah, are can be found in the speaker bio section on this site. Um, all of us at the Dana-Farber, uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for your participation and philanthropic re, uh, support. Uh, Todd and Kelsey Cunningham, Allison men mentioned this earlier, uh, hats off to you guys because you and your team are the ones that pull this together every year. And all this did was add an extra layer of complexity to what you had to do to, to make this meeting happen. And Allison and I thank you for that very much. And so do the rest of the speakers and the audience as well. Um, their team will be following up with uh, meeting notes in the coming weeks and want to encourage anyone who has questions uh, about how to become more involved with the Dana-Farber or has interest in learning more about a certain project uh, that they learned about today to reach out to Todd or Kelsey. Uh, all content from today's meeting event will be available on the event landing page following this event. Uh, if you're interested, we encourage you to log back in and watch any of the other breakout sessions that maybe you were not uh, able to see. You can only see one at a time, obviously, but they're all out there. Uh, if you've got the time and interest, focus in on some of the others as well. Um, uh, we appreciate your attention this afternoon and your continued commitment to our mission at Dana-Farber, and it is now my 
pleasure to turn the program back over to Dr. Uh, Glimpshire, who will provide a few closing remarks. Thank you all very much. Hello again. I hope you all enjoyed a productive breakout session and the time to connect with one another. Please accept my sincere gratitude for your participation. And again, I would like to thank Dana Farber's trustee and faculty chairs whose names you'll see on your screen for leading today's discussions. They have diligently taken note of your questions and ideas, and I'm looking forward to meeting with them next week for an executive session to ensure that I am apprised of your questions and your ideas and your feedback. While, of course, uh, we would have preferred to meet in person, as we have for nearly two decades for this symposium, one distinct opportunity of this year's format is the ability to expand access to this program to an even wider community. In fact, at the executive session last year, one of the main recommendations from our trustee and faculty co-chairs, based on your feedback, was to shape, share this symposium more widely through video and technology to enable even greater participation for those who might not be able to get to Boston. To that end, recordings from today will be available to you and to those who couldn't join us live. As well, the community and resources sections at the top of this event platform will continue to be available in the months ahead. And those are additional ways to stay engaged with each other and to spread the word to others about Dana-Farber's advances in research and care. At Dana-Farber, together, our community is a force to be reckoned with and we can't ignore cancer. Our together is comprised of you, our foremost advocates, and our physicians, nurses, clinical support staff, whose compassion is a beacon of hope, and our scientists who are among the most brilliant minds in the world, and children and adults with cancer who motivate all of us to accelerate prevention, therapies, and cures. Our together is embodied by the Jimmy Fund and our mantra, we're all Jimmy, we're all Jimmy, where Jimmy is every patient, doctor, nurse, staff member, donor, and event participant. Everyone who joins to support groundbreaking cancer research and care at Dana-Farber, as you will witness on the screen now to close today's program. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you strength, wellness, and peace to you and your families. Jimmy is a boy, saved from leukemia by Dr. Sidney Farber. Jimmy is a girl, a nephew, a husband, a wife. Jimmy is every patient ever at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Their families, friends, neighbors. Every doctor, nurse, and researcher at Dana-Farber. Every event walker, runner, rider, and golfer. Support the Jimmy Fund and give more and more of us a second chance at life. Because we're all Jimmy.